Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 47 of the Commando Voice. On this episode, I speak to our very own Renaissance woman. Please welcome Mary Pilkington. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kamano Voice Podcast, where I interview folks around Kamano Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Kamano Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, I got to speak with Mary Pilkington. And you may have heard of her. Um, you may have even heard her speak. Um, she's spoken at local events as well as some schools in the area, talking about her late husband, Fred Pilkington, who was a World War II ex-POW um, and fought at Battle of the Bulge, which was the largest uh, land battle that the U.S. has ever fought in. Um, so anyways, that was super fascinating to hear about that. But her, she is also very fascinating. She has done... Um, prior to having a back surgery, which caused her to have crutches full time, she was an avid downhill skier, but the, the, the crutches have not slowed her down physically. She still continues to do lots of outdoor activities such as hiking, uh, cross country skiing. Uh, and she's also a part of our, the yoga community at movement art studio. So, um, I do apologize for the audio on this one. The internet was a little shaky. Um, but, uh, I, we did our best with trying to make it work. Um, but she's, uh, great lady, great to talk with her and to hear her history. Um, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Mary Pilkington. Hey, Islanders, it's Brandon with Kamano Voice. And today I'm here with our very own Renaissance woman. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Mary Pilkington. How are you doing today? Oh, how are you? How are you? Good. Well, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, before we get into all of the questions, tell us a little bit about Mary. Well, I uh, live here on Camano Island. I moved here from New York. Um, I do artwork. I'm in a lot of organi- local organizations. I've been here since 1987, a long time. Lots hey. happened on the islands then. Yeah. And uh, just... Uh, the Seattle to the Panay, the theaters and museums, um, belong to our Camino Arts Association, American Association of University of Women. I do yoga. I hike a lot. I like to travel. Um, All right. Well, I'm just book clubs. One especially interesting is called Classic Salon, and we read books that are a hundred years older or, or more. Books that have stood the test of time, like Shakespeare, etc. Oh, very so cool. I, I, Filed in a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. You you certainly seem like you stay busy. <laughs> All right. So to start things off, um, where did you grow up? Well, century. I don't really have a hometown. I tell people um, my father transferred in his job every two to five years, so we moved I was several states. I grew up in Illinois, Indiana, Texas, and Tennessee. Okay. I was in three elementary schools and three different high schools. At the time, I thought that was terrible and it was hard, but our family, we adapted each time we moved. But I realized as I got older that it actually prepared me with in life, you know, adjusting to new situations and unexpected situations. I think that helped me as life went along, having to do that, move all the time and keep adjusting and keep meeting new people and new schools, and I think it turned out to be a positive thing for me. Yeah. Well, and and I actually had a, a gal named Jennifer on the podcast who said a similar thing. She, Her parents were in the Army, or her dad was, I believe, and uh, so they moved a lot. And she said as a kid it was rough, but um, as she's gotten older in life, she said it's really helped her to adapt to new situations. So that's, that's very yeah, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was a very positive thing, although at the time it didn't seem so. <laughs> as, as a kid, you know, in school, you hate leaving your friends and going to a new town, new state, everything. But right. It was good in the Okay. So how what was that like ex- for you during that time then? I mean, I know it wasn't necessarily pleasant as a kid, but what was that like moving to new elementary schools um, so often and stuff? 
and then into high school. I, you know, you moved and you started in school and you just little by little, you know, adjusted and made new friends. And um, then it seemed in a few years you did that all over again because you got transferred again. So okay. I said it was hard, but I feel like now it was positive in the end. Yeah. What was your favorite of the like schools that you guys lived in? Like, where was your favorite place that you were living during that time? Oh gosh, I don't know that there was a favorite. Um, I know we lived outside of Houston a while. It was nice to go down to the Galveston to the beaches. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although it was a long time ago, and it was before air conditioning. I just remember Texas being so incredibly hot. Oh, that sounds miserable, Texas without air conditioning. <laughs> so, yeah, this was a long time ago. Yeah, before time of air, yeah, was prevalent everywhere. Wow. And, uh, okay, very cool. Um, so what? So when was that? Like, what? What kind of years were you in elementary and high school? And what? Can you describe kind of what it was like back then? Well, you know, I. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1961, and um, was, uh, when I started college, my parents moved to Tennessee, and this was like in early 60, 59, 60, and I found that most interesting in that this was the South and the racial barriers that were there, and it was just, um, this was during the time that there were separate water fountains, white and colored. Separate restrooms, white and colored. Okay. And that was a very interesting experience. I found that very hard to be living there in that kind of situation. Yeah. So that was... When I came home from yeah. college, I came home from college to Memphis on the train. And when we got to the Kentucky border, the train stopped and every um, who was an African-American had to move to the back train of the back car of the train. Wow. Which I just found, you know, absurd. But that was the way it was in those days, at least in the South, in that part of the South. Yeah. So then, uh, I guess going back a little bit, with the elementary schools and high schools, were you moving, like, were you in the northern part of the country throughout any of that time? Or were you mainly moving around the south end of the country? Well, we. I said we started in central Illinois and then to Indiana and then to Texas and then back to Illinois and then they went to Tennessee. Okay. So then was at it at that point oh, I was ahead. in college at that point. Yeah, I was in college at that point. They oh. moved more after that, but I was already out of college and gone. Okay, got it. And was was this prevalent through all of those places you were living? The racial thing? Yeah. And just from um in Tennessee. Okay. Texas, we had, it was interesting there, we had um, a large Mexican population, and the Mexican students were in school with the white students, but the black students had their own high school. So there was that kind of segregation. Really? In, in Texas. But I don't recall there, and I was younger then, the, the, like the different restrooms and waiting rooms, you know, white and colored. And I just noticed that when we were in Tennessee. Okay. Okay. So then, um, thankfully that has changed. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. And then, so during your, let's see, you graduated in 1961. Um, so like a lot of the, did you see a lot of the effects of like growing up and stuff of being in a post World War II era? Did, was that something like as you were growing up, it was kind of, like talked about a lot still, or was it, what, what's your, kind of your experience from that? Really, because World War II, you know, this was in the 40s, so mm -hmm. you know, I was only, I know Fred was several years older than me, so like when he was in the Army and yeah. in Europe and captured and so on, yeah, I was like five years old, so I don't really have a lot of memories of World War II. I was too young. Okay. Um... But then, then as you, as you were continuing to grow and stuff, you had, uh, like, you were there when, with the death of uh, Martin Luther King. What was that experience like? Oh, did you catch that? 
I know. I didn't. I lost you there. I oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so you were there during like the death of uh, Martin Luther King. What was that experience like for you? Well, actually, when that happened, I had just finished graduate school and I was um, looking for another t- teaching job. And I decided on my spring break, I would drive from University of Illinois, where I was finishing school, out to New York City. Okay. And while I'm, I hear on the radio, Martin Luther King assassinated. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, so what should I do? Well, I decided to just continue, so I went on. And when I got to White Plains, New York, which was just north of New York City, um, I went to check into a motel and they asked if I'd had any dinner. And I said, no. He said, well, we have a you know substantial black community here. And we know with Dr. King dying, we don't know what's going to happen. I suggest you get something to eat and then come back to your room and not leave for okay. the rest of the night, which I and then I experienced it because they didn't know if there were going to be problems. If there were, I didn't know anything. Yeah. Thing about I drove from there to Washington, D.C., and Baltimore was a lot of that was burning at the time in protest of his death. And I remember the one thing when I got to Washington, D.C., I decided I wanted to go to Arlington National Cemetery, where I'd never been. And the police stopped me and told me I was out after curfew. And I know there was a curfew. Dr. King had been killed, and you know, you have to go back to your hotel, wherever you're staying. So those I found, you know, unusual times, I must say. Yeah. Wow. That must have been, yeah, that would be so crazy to have that type of experience. Like weird. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So then going back a little bit then. um, So you graduated high school in 1961. Um, No, that was college. Oh, that was college. Sorry. Yeah, 57. I was in Southern Illinois at the time. I went to Southern Illinois University. I see. Okay. So what what kind of um, prompted you to continue to pursue college after high school? Well, you you know, it was sort of understood in the family that we had college. My mother had attended a business school. My father's Dad died when he was nine from the flu in 1918 19, that we hear so much about today, that Spanish flu. Yeah. He had scholarships to go to college and he couldn't use them because he had to go to work and help take care of his mother and his two younger sisters. So he did not go to college, but all through the years, you know, they just, it was always understood that we would be going to college. So it wasn't a matter of what prompted me, it was just what, you know, this is something you were going to do. Yeah. So you're not intended teacher uh, go ahead oh yeah so what was um what was your sorry uh what was your uh your parents profession that caused them to move so much then oh my father worked for a natural gas pipeline company okay that ran from the mexican border um all the way to michigan and somehow they felt that supervisors which he was um the local laborers work better if they're supervised correctly. Yeah. So you'd get offered a transfer, and if you didn't take it, was usually a promotion. And if you didn't take it at that point, you know, you probably wouldn't get another offer. So each time we just took the promotions and moved. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, they did. Oh, go ahead. The people who lurked locally stayed. They didn't transfer any of them. They only transferred the management level. I see. Okay. Got it. Um, okay. So then um, how many siblings did you have? Okay. And then two. I'm both younger than me. Okay. So you were the oldest. I was the oldest. Got it. Okay. And then um, what was the... What was it that made you want to pursue teaching then within graduate or in college? Well, I actually wasn't going to be a teacher. I did get a scholarship. I was in a small school when I graduated in Southern Illinois, and I got a teaching scholarship, and I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. But I really wanted to be in business. And um, the scholarship, they enrolled me in education. And I actually, in the interim, my parents get moved to Tennessee. It was paying my out-of-state tuition. And I decided I really don't want to be a teacher. So I moved myself to the College of Education. And then I got a letter to say, well, you're, now that you're not there in education, your scholarship's canceled. So 
I went back and re-enrolled myself back in the School of Education, thinking I'd have a degree if I ever wanted it. And as a senior in college, I had to student teach, and I found that I absolutely loved it. Oh, very cool. Um, I did business, and I didn't really like it. At that point, you were teaching typing and shorthand. I thought, well, I don't want to teach this. So I looked to see. I had a minor in math and a minor in English, so I decided I learned I could get certified to teach math. So I got a, when I graduated, I got a teaching job in Springfield, Illinois, and it was in a junior high teaching math. Okay. And I, again, I just loved the teaching, and then I just didn't feel that was the best grade level for me, and I wanted to be in a high school. But having only a math minor, I thought, I can't get a master's in math. I'll have to get one in education with a uh, specialty in math. And a really interesting story here. I don't know if the University of Education Department, they told me they couldn't accept me into the program. Okay. And they asked why. They said, because you may be in calculus as an undergraduate. <laughs> and um, I guess that I went to guidance counseling or something. I was so, so upset. I went to the School of Mathematics and met with the dean and told him I would make up all the courses between what I'd done in the undergraduate as a minor to, to up to the major if they didn't let me work on a master's in mathematics, not education. Okay. And they did. Okay. I mean, a little over a year, but I did that. that master's in math, and then decided that I didn't want to stay in the Midwest any longer, and I also had this yearning and dream to travel in Europe, and I knew that if I stayed in the Midwest, I'd never make enough money to ever be able to go to Europe. <laughs> so I started looking at different options. People came to the University of Illinois, it's a big, big school, and interviewed from, I interviewed people from the West Coast, the East Coast, and then, as I said, in spring break, I decided that there was a couple of offers in the East Coast, I decided to drive out there. I interviewed, again, in White Plains, New York, and also in several places around Washington, D.C., and Virginia, and Maryland, and ended up taking the job in White Plains. In the high school. Okay. And then, so what do you think, what did I teach all through my teaching career? I taught advanced placement calculus. <laughs> that counselor wouldn't admit me because I'd made a C as an undergraduate. I always, you know, it obviously did better. It was interesting <laughs> in graduate school as a woman because in math, there, there was only two, maybe three women in all of my math classes at the graduate level. Okay. Oh. They were, and then I found once I got into teaching and into the field of math that it, it was a ma very male-dominated field. Yeah. I stuck with it. and I, um, Yeah. Well, it, actually, so with that then, so overall, this is in the like 19, you know, right, right around 1960s then, is, was there a lot of women in general going to college during this time? And were they just mainly going to like nursing into other fields, or was it mainly male dominated in in the college? I don't remember statistics. Many women. There were plenty of women in college for sure. Okay. It wasn't that there were college was male dominated. It was the field of math was male dominated. Yes. In classes. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think that's really changed. In my uh, when I went to school for engineering. There was not, there was like two or three girls that were in our, our class um, that you would see every once in a while, you, your class would overlap, but overall, mainly mainly guys that were doing it all, so. Right, we've been the same thing, yeah, with yeah. math, I'm imagining. Okay. So then what, where did you go? You were teaching up in, you said New York then? I was teaching in White Plains, which is just north of New York City. Okay. So real quick drive into New York City, or excuse me, not drive, well, you could drive, but we took the train, um, and so you go in, you know, and you had the Metropolitan Museum of Art, all the art museums, you had the music, and you had the Broadway and the theaters, and it just really, really awakened interest in all of those things for me, and um, I said part of my bigger salary than the Midwest was to go to Europe, so after one year of teaching, my sister from Denver and I went with two friends, and we went to Europe for six weeks, traveled all over Europe. Oh, very so cool. So I did, did get to do that. and um, But that also, I think, awakened my interest in art and music and a lot of things. I uh, started taking art courses and painting courses, and um, I learned to ski and 
started going to Vermont skiing every weekend. I just loved it. I did well. Very cool. So that became a real passion. Yeah. So I had to quit the downhill. My crutches after this recent surgery because I'd been a diehard die downhill skier for 50 years. So that was hard to not be able to do that. Yeah. But I, I um, snowshoed at Baker. I cross country skied. My sister and I met in Yellowstone a year ago, February, for a week, and I cross country skied there. The ski poles act as my crutches, so I did okay with that. I just can't downhill ski anymore. I see. Okay, so. Oh, okay. Sorry, you cut out there for a second there. Oh, are you there? I'm here now, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so for some of our listeners, they may not um, know, um, talk a little bit about the fact that you, you have crutches now at, at, full, at all times. Um, talk about a little bit how that came about and, and when that happened. Well, this was, uh, I think, four years ago, and I had horrific back pain to the point that I just couldn't function. And of interventions, and none of them worked, so I had back surgery, and very extensive surgery, and they fused with rods and screws from uh, L2 to S1 in my spine. Took away all my back pain, which is wonderful, but they damaged the L5 nerve in my back during the surgery, and my right leg doesn't work right. Okay out it doesn't work right i'm off balance and so i am on crutches and at this point they don't think that nerve will come back or regenerate okay so i just had to figure out that i want to do using crutches <laughs> i'm not going to quit doing stuff well, yeah yeah so the challenge yeah so then with that then so you said you used to do all this downhill skiing um even since having the crutches though um, touch again on, on different things that you've been able to continue to do even with that well I continue the big thing I continue hiking um, in fact the high country with Colorado Rockies with my sister I go to Mount Rex several days every fall as Brett and I did for twice a year for over a quarter of a century I hike locally um so that's one th- important thing to me that I'm able to do. That you know, they, they act as my hiking sticks. Actually, better than hiking sticks. They're more <laughs> secure and more balanced. And um, I said I have been able to snowshoe and cross country ski using ski poles because wow. they also act as crutches. Yeah, that's incredible. And then I, yeah, I go to the gym. Well, it's closed now, but eventually it'll reopen. And I do yoga at Movement Arts here on the island. And I think that. It's the yoga that has helped me in main these things, even with, I don't think I'd be as good as I am without the yoga. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. They're, they're great over there at Movement Arts. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Um, okay. So then you, you were doing teaching and, and stuff like that. Um, when did you end up meeting your, your husband, Fred Pilkington? Well, I was a teacher, as I said, in White Plains, New York in a high school. And we had had some interesting times there. This was the 60s, and there was uh, racial unrest. There was the Vietnam War. And we had had some riots in our school. Uh, people coming in and uh, destroy the school during, I mean, this was rather frightening. I mean, it was during school days. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up being called down to the office to help with things. And then I got a call after that by an uh, assistant principal who was on Long Island and saying, I want you to apply for a job for the mathematics department head in a high school on Long Island. And I said, why would I do that? I'm not certified as an administrator. Oh, they'll let you go to school at night to do that. We, t- we watched how you functioned during that crisis we had, and you'll make a good administrator. It's just a lark. I decided I'd go down to that interview, and I was interviewed by a principal and two assistant principals, and one of the assistant principals was Fred. Okay. So that's how I met him. Years okay. later, after we were married, he would tell people that he was the only one who voted against me. <laughs> but I don't, I don't believe it. <laughs> so I was department head of math for a number of years there. It's a large high school on Long Island, central Long Island. And then a promoted 
district directors, and then as opposed to just the high school. And then when the science department director retired, they decided I could do science and math. So the last few years I was there, I was a district director for science and math, K to 12. Okay. In that high school, in that district in Long Island. Okay. Very cool. How did you, so, I mean, you guys were in the interview together, but then did you and Fred start like hanging out together during teaching time or like after teaching times or how did that uh, evolve over time? I, um, we were both administrators in the same school for many years. Um, and he was married, had a family, and then his wife um, contracted cancer and died. In fact, they moved here to Camano Island. His son is an architect builder in Seattle, designed and built this house that um, we're in. And um, unfortunately, very tragically, she had been diagnosed with cancer and died just a few months later. Okay. He came back to New York and he kept the house, came back to New York. And um, after time together we've known each other a long time and deciding to get married and then I quit working and we moved out here and that was 1987 so we've been out here a long time okay very cool um so I know that you've done a lot of speaking engagements and stuff talking a lot about um Fred and kind of his story um can you share some of that with us you know I was just um he was in college at the time World War II broke out. And, um, well, I'm just, uh, you know, honored that people need to talk about this. Um, he didn't talk about this um, for years after after the war, as most people did. And he was one of those greatest generations. And then a few years ago, a professor, college professor in Idaho had asked him to write, answer some questions in a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And just didn't think he wanted to do it. And I told him, you know, your kids don't know your story. I don't know your story. Nobody does. I think you should do this. So he answered this questionnaire. He more than answered it. He, he sat down and wrote his story, what happened to him in the war. And and um, I kind of I watched all those memories pour out on paper as he's writing up at his growing table. And then when people would ask him to talk about it, he would. And he gave talks uh, up until the time that he died. And then just been in the last couple of years that I was asked to give talks, uh, like at the Floyd and the schoolhouse, a number of places, and even some places out, out off Camino Island. Um, but he was, um, they just up and left college. I can't imagine people doing that today. He's truly were the greatest generation. Yeah. So they, they left. And the boy do you. When the war broke out, World War II, all these guys just quit college, and a lot of women too, and joined the armed services, the various branches. And he joined the army and was deployed to Europe. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which is the largest land battle ever fought by the United States Army. There was over a million soldiers in, the, in that battle, and there were 81,000 casualties. And most people don't know about that battle. They hear more about Normandy. Yeah. And they, but anyway, while they were fighting, he stepped on a mine and was captured by the Germans. He spent four months in German prison camp. He was very fortunate that he was able to save his legs. He didn't, they operated and didn't have to amputate his legs. It was, um, the camp was liberated by the British. And he was, as I said, he was fortunate to be there only four months. And then he spent time in England being recuperating uh, till he could walk again and then came back to the United States and went back to college, finished his degree, became an art teacher, head of an art department, and then, and okay. then I said people were asked to tell his story, and I, you know, have been very honored to do so. Um, it's a real lesson in history, for sure. Yeah. No, that's, that's crazy. And the thought of a million people like a million Americans there, like it's just mind boggling. It doesn't, I can't even like fathom what that looks like because of how large right. scale that that's, is. That's that one battle. Yeah. They were in France, Belgium, and Germany there. Yeah. That doesn't account to all of us. Right. Man. Soldiers in another place in the world during the war. Wow. But today people don't realize the, the uh, magnitude of World War II. 
the amount of soldiers who were there and how important a war it was for our freedom. Right. Yeah. Well, that's very cool and, and you know, very thankful for people like Fred who, who you know, set aside their own goals and passions and, um, and fought for the country, this country. Absolutely. So, um, so, so what ended up bringing you guys to Kameno? I guess you said Fred still had the house over here. Um, did he ever talk about how they discovered Kameno? Well, his son Peter was living here, and it told them if they came out, they liked the climate. Area. They didn't want to stay in New York after retirement, and so they were thinking where they would move. It, you know, I'll design and build you a house. So Fred had come out, and he found a piece of property, and Peter designed and built a house. Okay. Very cool. They and didn't want to go. A lot of people in New York go to Florida, and they'd want to go there. Just love them. So that's how they ended up here. Because Peter was already out here with his family. I see. Okay. Um, so then, with you moving over here, I guess you you were used to moving around, so you didn't mind moving to another place then. No, actually, I think back to this time when. Um, I did a lot of things. It was in a four-month period. I decided um, to get. We decided to get married. I was still working. We decided, um, and I found out I had cancer. Death. Unfortunately, I'm a lucky survivor of breast cancer. But we didn't know what was going to happen. So he said, well, "You just quit your job." I was still working, and we will move to Camino, and we'll do art and travel. So I think in four months' time, I decided to get married. I found out I had cancer. Oh. I quit my job, and I moved 3,000 miles away. <laughs> in the period of four. And I think it was the best decision I ever made, but I think back, and I think I probably all that moving around growing up helped me just make that kind of move 3,000 miles away where I didn't know anybody and go on with my life. Yeah. Said I'm lucky. I'm very fortunate to be a cancer survivor. Yeah. So how long was that fight then of, of fighting cancer? Well, it actually was not all that. Fortunately, they caught it very early, and um, I was in New York, so we had the surgery. They had a radiation there, and then I was followed by Swedish Hospital for many many years out here, and I had no reoccurrences. Very cool. Congratulations. That's that's very cool to um, hear. Um. So then you guys moved out here, but then you've mentioned before that you guys did a lot of traveling as well afterwards, right? Right, we did. We were very fortunate to have done a lot of traveling. Um, he has two daughters in New York. I have a brother and a sister. One's in uh, Denver and one that's in, well, I've been a few places, but uh, Nebraska and Wisconsin, now South Dakota. So we drove cross country every year for 25 years in our vehicle, not, not an RV, and to visit all his family. Okay. And we'd go six weeks, and we would hike, and, and initially we used to camp, and then we decided we liked the hot showers at night, so we started <laughs> staying in the national park lodges. Yeah. And we've hiked most, we've traveled in most of the national parks in the country, every state in the country. Um, and just, you know, spend time hiking. We'd go the northern route one way, the southern route another way. Um, so we've seen, all the, been in all the states and just seen it. It's an incredible country we have here. Yeah. And um, and then we did some, we were fortunate to do some international travel. We actually um, talk about milestones and historic events after 9-11. Um, yeah. We had, we had a trip planned to Europe. And so the 1st of October, everybody said, you can't leave after that tragedy. You can't get on a plane. Well, we got on the plane in October the 1st of that year, and everything was fine. There were no Americans traveling in Europe at that time. There were a lot of Europeans traveling. Yeah. But um, And then one time we went back to see um, all the places he'd been during the war, when he, where he was captured, and he'd been, been there. So we spent three weeks in Belgium um, wow. on the trip. And, and we, we just, we, um, so we were fortunate to have traveled. We went, we went to South America, we went to China, we went to Africa, safari. Um, we were fortunate. 
Very cool. So what, which uh, of the countries and places that you visited, what was your favorite? Oh, people would ask us that. If you had to go back someplace, what was your favorite? And we, we'd say Africa. Well, it's just an incredible place. Just yeah. Fall in love with people and the animals, apes, everything about it. We were on African safari, Kenya and Tanzania, and we, on a different trip, we were in Egypt. Okay. And we just, Africa to be the most amazing place in this, in this world. Very cool. Yeah, that's that's a harder continent to get to from here as well because you got to at least do two major jumps to get down Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. Long way. All the others, China is too, and, and we were also we were in Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand. All worlds are and New Zealand. Oh, very cool. I said we were fortunate to have been able to travel. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and then you said you you also plan to every year I go down. Fred is, we were very honored that he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, outside of Washington D.C. I yeah. go back every year to visit him. Oh, and I've got my tickets for this year, but who knows if the planes will even be flying by October? We'll see what happens. If I yeah. Take that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping flights and everything will start getting opened up and everything again once, you know, once we can get past this, the main push of everything. So, um, all right. So you, you said you got kind of in, you got involved in the arts and stuff when you were up in New York and then traveling Europe. Um, you've con- have you continued to do that since moving here and, and being involved with the arts? Yeah, we have. Well, Fred and I, we joined main Arts Society. He was always on the studio tour, and I worked with him. He was a printmaker with etchings and block prints, so we worked on those through the years. We have an etching press in our home, one of our studios, and um, I had taken painting courses, and I'm back to, back to doing that, and I'm back to painting, um, which I just think I did better with than the printmaking. Okay. <laughs> so I'm still actively taking art courses and painting. Okay. And, and I'm very active member of the uh, Camino Arts Association and uh, working on some course. Sadly, we had to cancel that tour this year. I know but, that um, that's a that's, massive loss. I mean, that's that's one of I mean, it's the, the biggest tour we have in this area. Absolutely, uh, but it, it it you just had to you couldn't do it. Right. Yeah. But it would have been last weekend and this weekend. Right. Yeah, and everything was shut down, so it just couldn't happen this year. Right. There is a virtual tour online. Okay. Look at some. Okay. Yeah, I didn't actually know there was a virtual tour. Yeah, the Camino Arts Association has that online, and I said it's not all the artists; it's a number of them that people can go on and see information about. I've forgotten the number that are on that virtual tour. Okay, cool. Um, and then most of the other t- art events and stuff, all of those have been canceled as well, right? Right. I just saw in this week's paper that Art Jam is canceled. And, um, I mean, everything's just on hold. Right. Everything culture-wise. I mean, you know, the theaters are shut down. The museums are shut down. Symphony's shut down. I mean, everything is on hold, culture-wise. Well, everything, not just culture. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, it's, it's, this is just such a crazy time to be living in right now. Um, all right. Well, <clears throat> I like to end every podcast with some rapid-fire questions. So the first one is, do you have a lesser known or favorite location on Camino Island that you like to hang out? Oh, I don't know. I just like all the parks, um, hiking trails and you know, two state parks and English Boom. And I like that new trail by the, the uh, bridge. Oh, I yeah. Know. I haven't been out there yet. Yeah, that's very nice. And then, of course, Barnum Point and just... All the uh, the park areas are my favorite places yeah. to hang out. Yeah, we have some really nice places to go and, and do hikes and hang out, for sure. 
Um, pretend you have a friend coming from out of town. Uh, what would their first day look like here? Oh, gosh. Well, I'd certainly we'd stop in at the Camino Commons and have coffee and a French pastry or a breakfast <laughs> sandwich. And then I certainly would take them around the island, try to tour the whole island and, and um, take them down to Carla's Gallery at the south end and walk Walker Sculpture Park. And then maybe even back at, we went to Cama Beach, you know, and the restaurants open, we could have lunch there. But mainly, it, you know, I just tour around. It's just beautiful. I mean, we have such a unique place to live here that is so beautiful. And yeah. people who don't live in you know, are just kind of entranced with the beauty of where we live. Yeah. Yeah, no, we definitely get spoiled here living, being here on Camino. Absolutely. All right. Who is a fascinating or interesting person in this community that I should interview next? Oh, it'd have to be Carla Madsky. Do you know Carla? I believe I've met her. Um, but I don't remember her. And I know I, her, she's been brought up multiple times on the podcast. Well, you need to meet her. Pardon? Oh, I was saying uh, she's been brought up multiple times on the podcast. Oh. So. Well, she should be. And you should, you should interview her. She has this incredible gallery on the south end of Ireland. She is an incredible artist in her own right. But it's a beautiful gallery. And then she has a 10-acre sculpture park with large installations. Yeah. And she her shows probably every six weeks and she runs a summer stone carving workshop and she just is a promoter of you need to know Carla Maddie. Yeah, you need to interview her I will yep very cool yeah no I've seen pictures of the sculpture garden and many people have, have talked about it um, so yeah I definitely I need to go visit it and, and get her on the podcast you do absolutely all right. And lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard right on Camino Island as you're driving up the hill, what would that say? Oh, gosh. It would probably say, art lives on Camino Island. All right. Well, Mary, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, Mary, are you there? Yeah, we kind of broke up there. I lost oh, you. <laughs> sorry. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. You're very welcome. This was fun. Yeah. No, I've been I've been needing been uh meaning to do this one for quite a while and um so yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. So Okay, you're very welcome. It's been um, my pleasure. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well a big thank you to Mary Pilkington for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to kaminocommons.com slash EP47. That's kaminocommons.com slash EP47. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.